Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sister Colleen Gibson. I'm a Sister of St. Joseph. And today, on today's webinar, I'm gonna serve as our facilitator. Um, and I'm kind of gonna act as the voice of the people as we move through today. So just a couple of notes before we begin. Um, a note that today's webinar is being recorded uh, and hopefully we'll be able to post that online afterwards. Only the people who are speaking will pop up on the screen and be recorded. Uh, so that'll be myself and uh, Dr. Phyllis Zagano, um, who will speak in a little bit. I'll also act as the voice for any questions that you might have. So some people sent questions in advance of today's webinar, and I have those. Um, but if you have any questions as we move along and as you kind of listen to the conversation, you can use the chat function here on Zoom, which if you click on the bottom of your screen, you'll see chat. That'll open up a window. You can type in a question, and I'll moderate those questions uh, just so that we don't have a lot of people talking at once. Uh, I'll, I'll ask those questions. So again, welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to have you. And we have people from uh, all around the world with us today. Um, and so tonight or today is going to be broken into two parts. Uh, we'll start out, Phyllis will give us a little bit of input on women deacons, the commission, uh, her work. And then after she's spoken for a little bit, we'll open the floor for questions and a little bit of Q&A and conversation. And so by way of introduction, um, Phyllis Zagano uh, is the Senior Research Associate in Residence in the Department of Religion at Hofstra University. She's an award-winning author and the editor of over 20 books in religious studies, a few of which she'll tell you about. Um, she's also the author of Women Deacons Past, Present, and Future, uh, and the author of the popular Just Catholic column in the National Catholic Reporter. Uh, she's an internationally acclaimed Catholic scholar and lecturer on contemporary spirituality and women's issues in the church. She just got back from being in Portugal uh, for a little stint. And in August of 2016, she was appointed by Pope Francis uh, to the Papal Commission for the Study of Women in the Diaconate, uh, which submitted its study to Pope Francis earlier this year. Um, and so as many of you know, and, and you've heard her speak uh, she really is an expert, really is engaging, and we're so happy to be able to listen to her today in today's webinar and to be able to engage in conversation about this important topic. So without further ado, I hand it over to Phyllis. Thanks, Colleen. I really appreciate it. Um, if you have uh, problems with uh, working the, event, the, uh, the Zoom, just send Colleen a note because I have no idea how it works. Uh, as Colleen said, I, I did just get back from Portugal where I spoke at the Catholic University of Lisbon and the Catholic University of Porto, uh, two very interesting events uh, where I was joined by fellow commissioner Bernard Poitier, a Jesuit who is uh, at the Jesuit Theologate at, uh, in Brussels and who uh, was secretary to the commission. Um, and. Uh, I, I found I found the the response in Portugal extraordinary. We um, uh, it's not an issue that's been discussed over there. Um, a lot of people didn't know about it. There was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm. The two meetings were totally different. Uh, Lisbon was mostly general public in the evening, and Porto was mostly students, seminarians in the uh, in the morning, and the uh, the seminarians were uh, by and large either extremely. Um, enthusiastic or extremely uh, defensive and angry about the whole idea. <clears throat> and I think that we'll find that that is the uh, response uh, around the world. Um, uh, although I was in Los Angeles in March at the Los Angeles uh, Religious Education Congress and I spoke to 4,000 people and we had a lot of hooting and hollering. So, so there is a lot of uh, groundswell and I appreciate you all taking the time to be with us today. Uh, we picked the time to make sure folks in Europe could get in, and I know we have uh, lots of people uh, from Ireland and, uh, and the UK and possibly Portugal online now. Um, what, what happened? What's happening? As you must know, the International Union of Superiors General on May 12, 2016 asked the Holy Father, um, why not have a commission? Women religious are already doing the work of the diaconate um, around the world why not recognize that? And he said, you know, that, that's a good idea. Well, I'll, I'll have a commission to study it. Well, we had the commission. I uh, traveled to Rome uh, 
four or five times. Uh, I was the only person from the Western Hemisphere to attend. Get this, I keep saying this, I just found this out a few months ago, to, to be part of a commission for the first time in the history of the church that was 50% male and 50% female. Um, uh, uh, the first time any deliberative body in the church, uh, it only took 2,000 years to be 50% male and 50% female. Um, it's an extraordinary honor to be able to, uh, to go. I know that I was on the list recommended by the uh, uh, UISG, the International Union of Superiors General, who were asked by the Holy Father to hand deliver their list to him, which they did. And uh, one can assume that the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith was also asked. And by my read, about a third of the group was uh, UISG picks, about a third were CDF picks, and about, uh, about a third were just Holy Father picks. Uh, uh, couldn't, couldn't figure out who, uh, who, who recommended them. Um, I can, if you're interested, I can give you the names, but they're online. Very, very uh, interesting, extraordinary people. But as I said, I'm the only person from the Western Hemisphere to attend. What did we do? Well, we did what academics do. We sat around and talked. Uh, we did provide a report to the Holy Father um, last July. And that's, that's all I can say. The Holy Father received the report. We know that. And we also um, know that the report was for his personal reflection. Uh, I, uh, Father Poitier affirmed just a few days ago to me that he, he does not think that the report will be published. Um, and and uh, I, I don't know if we will be asked for more work. I do know that the Holy Father will be speaking to the International Union of Superiors General on May 10th at noon and if I were the Holy Father, I wouldn't walk into a room with a thousand nuns without an answer. But it's, you know, it's up to him um, to decide. Uh, people ask me, well, uh, what will happen? I have no idea what could happen. Uh, he, is, he is highly synodial. He, he likes to ask, uh, ask uh, people's opinions. And I know he wants this matter discussed, which is part of the reason uh, Colleen and I have been doing these webinars. And I've been uh, resume my uh, public speaking. Uh, the Holy See asked me for the term of the commission not to do any public speaking uh, on the topic. Uh, I could speak on other things, but not about women deacons. And as I said to Cardinal Ladari, if I stand up there, they're not going to ask me about Catherine of Siena. So um, I only spoke um, uh, about uh, uh, women deacons January 15th at Fordham University with Bernard Poitier and with uh, uh, Donna Cianggio, who is the Chancellor of the Archdiocese of Newark, and that you can find online. There's all sorts of uh, things. I'm, I'm actually just reviewing uh, Santa Clara University uh, in California on the 25th of, uh, of uh, March, uh, where, where I was with Gary Macy, who's the historical expert really on the matter in medieval times. Lynn Osick would be the uh, historical expert in, in the early church. And um, so, uh, you know, point being, I've been speaking around, but, but all that to answer the Holy Father's interest in uh, having the matter discussed. When I speak, and, uh, you know, I can't tell you what's in the report, but I can tell you outside the report and outside of the CDF meeting rooms, the conversations and discussion, uh, the couple of points come up. One, um, the argument that women were never really ordained, that women were only blessed. Well, here's a news flash. The terms ordained and blessed in the early church were used interchangeably. And uh, uh, if the women were not ordained, then neither were the men, any of the men, priests, bishops, you know. And, uh, but, but what the ceremonies that we do have, and there's some extraordinarily strong ceremonies we have about naming, uh, claiming, creating women as deacons, they, they have the... Uh, 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 the ritual includes uh, the fact that the, these ceremonies, the ritual, the ordination is, is done inside, inside the altar rail, at the altar, during a mass, at the same time other ordinations are done, uh, that the bishop lays hands on the women to be, woman to be ordained, that he invokes the Holy Spirit, that he, uh, at, during the mass, uh, she, she takes the, the chalice from the altar and self-communicates, that he gives her a stole, and that's a very important thing because the stole is the, uh, the authority to proclaim the gospel. 
but most importantly, calls her deacon. And if she wasn't a deacon, she'd be called something else. Uh, and, and we have this, uh, this through history. What did they do? Well, they did all sorts of things. They certainly, we know about women uh, assisting, women deacons assisting other women in baptism, and that makes sense because the uh, baptismal pools were stone concentric circle, their structures or, or step downs, very dangerous if you're all anointed. Um, the man would not be anointing, a bishop or, or priest would not be anointing the woman. Um, because he wouldn't touch anybody he wasn't married to, but he also wouldn't even look at her. I, I, I translated one, art, one article where they explained that the bishop would simply uh, be on the other side of a curtain, and at the appropriate time, he'd stick his arm through the curtain and kind of bless, you know. Uh, we don't have much evidence of men, de men deacons participating in baptism, uh, which I think is a very important point. Um, we know that women deacons catechized, took care of the women's part of the assembly. We know that women deacons anointed ill women. Uh, Daniel Liu feels, uh, reading Epiphanius, he feels that they were uh, sacramentally ordained. Women deacons carried communion to ill women. Um, and Pope Francis brought something up on the 12th of May in 2016 that I'd never heard before, which is that um, when a woman accused her husband of beating her, she would go to the woman deacon who would examine the bruises and the woman deacon would give testimony to the bishop. Now to me, that's a kind of early annulment. Um, and to, today, to render a judgment of nullity for, for a marriage, um, you have to have testimony, you take testimony, the judgment is written, but only a cleric can sign that, that judgment uh, on behalf of the bishop. Uh, no woman is a cleric. Um, so essentially uh, a woman canonist who prepares the document has to um, get uh, a cleric to sign it. Uh, to me, that's disingenuous. Um, but that's because of the new rules where the Holy Father says single sign or no, no second instance. Women deacons uh, read the gospel, women deacons preached. As, as the diaconate died out, as the diaconate died out, uh, women deacons went away. Why the diaconate die out? Well, priests and deacons didn't get along that well. Why not? Deacons were very powerful. We have 64 popes who were never deacons. Oh, excuse me, were never, were never uh, priests. 64 of them went from being, um, being, being a deacon to being the Bishop of Rome. Um, and it makes sense because the deacon was the manager of the diocese and there were no seminaries, um, certainly no business schools. So if you needed another bishop, an overseer, episcopi, um, you simply um, went to the deacon. And uh, so bishops uh, in, in all sorts of territories were chosen from among the deacons. Um, so you have, th these are the men deacons. The women deacons, as I said, were never in so much in that, that situation. We do have Anna, the deacon of Rome, who was the treasurer of, of, the, of the diocese. Uh, but in the time that I'm speaking of, women deacons had pretty much moved into the monasteries and you have the development of the deacon abbess or the abbess deacon. Uh, in any event, we have a thing called the Curses on Orm, and I'll stop after I talk about that. Um, the term comes from Roman, uh, Roman political uh, uh, chain of command or Roman political advancement. Uh, you would have a political job, then you'd have a military job, then you have a political job. So the Curses on Orm for the church, uh, first you were tonsured, then you became a porter, then a lector, uh, then an exorcist, then an acolyte. These four minor orders were ordained orders outside the, the, the sanctuary in the, um, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the sacristy. Uh, the minor orders of subdeacon, deacon, and priest were ordained orders inside the sanctuary. But by the time you get to the um, Gregorian reform, which was codified by a man named Gresham into canon law, um, you find that you could not be ordained a deacon unless you were going to be ordained a priest. Well, women were never in the cursus honorum, so women, the female diaconate died out. Even though it lasted as a standalone ministry, it, la it died out um, very soon by the 12th century. We have Otto of Lucca uh, still ordaining women in, in uh, northern Italy uh, in the 12th century, and, and uh, but, and, and in the East, of course, they never got involved with the curses on Orm. The diaconate and the priesthood were totally separate. So in the East, really, they continued to ordain women as deacons, as they do today. Um, 
I, I was reminded the other day by Father Poitier, you know, um, the uh, Patriarch of Alexandria gathered his bishops recently, not within the last year, and they had one meeting. I uh, said, what do we do about women deacons? They said, yeah, let's ordain women deacons. So they ordained women deacons. They ordained five last November, one meeting, you know. Uh, meanwhile, we've been talking about this for quite, quite some time. Uh, I want to give time for questions. Uh, and so if we, if Colleen has questions, we'll go for it. Great. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, we have a, a bunch of questions that have come in. And I uh, just remind people, if you have questions as you're listening, you can type them in on the chat function and that will come right up on my screen and I'll be able to, you know, moderate from there. The first question, Phyllis, comes from uh, Eugene and he says uh, he's an advocate for female ordination to the diaconate and he's expressed uh, that the church has an obligation to reasonably provide for members to fulfill their vocation, vocation that God's written on their hearts and to reply, uh, and people have replied to him that God doesn't call women to preach. And so uh, he thinks of a, a bunch of different ways that things that he could cite, but he says, uh, what scriptural or historical evidence supports that women are called by God to preach the gospel? Uh, well, I don't think we'd have a church without Mary Magdalene. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a, a meme going around that says in, in the interest of historical accuracy, all, preaching this Easter of the resurrection will be done by women, you know. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, we're all called to preach. We're all called to, um, to witness the word of God. If you're speaking about uh, the law, the current law about preaching, um, anyone can preach outside uh, the mass, a homily, is restricted to the Mass, and this was uh, part of what the Holy Father presented in his answer to the first question of the sisters who asked about preaching. Only a cleric participating in a given Mass can preach at that Mass, given that he has faculties and all the others. Uh, there is no ability for a bishop to give a woman permission to preach during a Mass, except at Masses for children, and technically, it's not called a homily when, when she explains the gospel uh, at, the, at the time of the homily. So uh, uh, I'm not sure if that answers Eugene's question, but uh, uh, the, the authority to preach, as I said earlier, um, has been rendered by bishops uh, ritually, formally, sacramentally uh, during the ordination of women as deacons, giving them the soul. If we're talking about that kind of preaching, preaching in the homily, um, it would require a diaconal ordination. I think that really is, is helpful. Uh, and so, Phyllis, a question that came from a group that's actually been reading your book and, and really studying women in the diaconate. Um, they have a question about uh, canon law, and uh, they, they point to canon 290, which I'll, I'll read. Um, because we might not all be from familiar with canon law. So uh, canon 290 says, once validly received, sacred ordination never becomes invalid. A cleric nevertheless loses the clerical state by two ways, by a judicial sentence or administrative decree, which declares the invalidity of sacred ordination, or by a rescript of the apostolic see, which grants it to deacons only for grave causes and to presbyters only for the most grave causes. Uh, so the, the group goes on to ask, you know, so what does this say about the status of a permanent deacon? Uh, are they of a lower status, less sinful, more holy? Uh, is there a, a hierarchy um, of rescripts? I, I would have to, I, I'm not a canonist. I would have to, uh, to look that up. I can, I can call the good folks in Wellesley, Massachusetts with an answer. Um, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I can't parse canon law at this point. I could refer people to, uh, to various uh, books, but that's, that's way above my pay grade. Mm -hmm. Then a, a follow-up or another question that they had. Um, is, is a permanent deacon ontologically changed? You know, the whole, the whole discussion of the ontological change 
really uh, emanates from the Second Vatican Council. And, and there's a trajectory of argument that, uh, that tries to join the priesthood and the diaconate uh, such that a woman would not be qualified. Um, <coughs> the ontological, uh, uh, the discussion about the ontological change is one that, uh, that I think confuses the issue. Uh, and, and it's because of the term sacred ordination. Uh, I, I, I have to, I have to say that, uh, with the Gregorian reform and the trajectory of the, of the cursus honorum, uh, the, t the, the discussion or the term only a, a baptized male is validly ordained, which is Canon 1024, um, really has to do with priesthood. Uh, because at the time of Gresham, and I'm aware there are Canon lawyers on board here, so maybe they can type in and help me out. But, um, at the, at the time of Gresham, only someone, as I said earlier, who was going to be a priest uh, was, was ordained as a deacon. So what is sacred ordination? Um, and, and so the, I, think, I think the discussion of the ontological change is a red herring in a way. Um, but I would say that that sacramental ordination would incur an ontological change if you are willing to say that baptism, for example, creates an ontological change. Uh, but it's not something that uh, has been uh, part of any discussion I've been in. Um, Phyllis, another question came in. Um, does a permanent deacon have any governing authority? And if so, how and where? And and if women were ordained to the diaconate, what type of authority or place at the table would it give them in the church? All right, well, I'll do the first part and then maybe you can reread the second. Uh, in terms of governance, if you're talking about jurisdiction, uh, probably not, uh, because canon law requires that, uh, for example, only a priest can be a pastor or an administrator. Technically, only a priest can be a chaplain but the use of that term is different in certain countries. So uh, in the United States, I know that uh, hospital chaplains, for example, who are not ordained priests can have chaplain, Catholic chaplain on their badges because uh, maybe Catholic lay ecclesial minister doesn't fit on the badge, but also it just, it's just uh, confusing to the people whom, whom they are ministering to. Um, the, uh, uh, any authority, uh, and again, this is, this is where the canonists uh, split hairs. Any, any authority, um, Episcopal authority, whether it can or cannot be delegated, uh, it's probably can't. I would fall on the can't side, uh, but that one could act on behalf of, which I think is a, a slight difference. Um, but in terms of having a place at the table, uh, women deacons would be clerics. And as clerics, they would be able to sign certain papers that non-clerics can't sign. Um, they would be able to, as I said earlier, uh, sign the, uh, the render the judgment of nullity on behalf of the bishop as a single, uh, single signer uh, to the document. And uh, they, they, they would have a certain status. More than the legal status, I think, is, is the necessary witness of the whole church, which is is given by the ordained person to the people of God, from the people of God to the people of God. Um, so, uh, I mean, a woman uh, deacon couldn't be a pastor, uh, but a woman deacon probably would be more likely uh, to be chosen uh, to be the uh, pastoral associate or the, the lay ecclesial minister, or, excuse me, not, wouldn't be a lay ecclesial minister, the pastoral uh, life coordinator uh, for a parish. In, in Los Angeles, I think there are eight uh, uh, pastoral uh, life coordinators. Uh, one laywoman I know of, a uh, couple of deacons, and, and uh, other dioceses in Albany, they had 10. Uh, 
I hate to say it's easier, but it is because uh, uh, a deacon would have ordinary faculties uh, to solemnly baptize and to witness marriages. And uh, you can go through hoops to get rescripts or waivers for um, uh, a lay person to do that. Um, but the, the deacon would have the, uh, I, I don't like the word authority, would have the ability um, to, uh, to uh, perform those sacraments uh, for and on behalf of the people of God. And the deacon could preach and uh, uh, preach the homily during the mass. Uh, and certainly the job of the deacon is to, uh, is to manage other liturgical uh, ceremonies and to bury the dead, um, to catechize, uh, and to manage the church's charity. So I don't know if that answers the second part of the question. Yeah, I think, I think it does. Um, going off of that, Phyllis, the, you're talking about the early uh, female diaconate and how um, early female deacons really ministered to the women of the church. Would you see, would that be adapted in modern times if there was a female diaconate today? Uh, what would be the role of women deacons uh, would it be just to serve women in the church or what, what would you see that as? You know, I was challenged on this. I, I debated Sarah Butler, uh, uh, who's a sister uh, who has written extensively against women priests and has recently uh, trans transferred her discussion against women as deacons. And she said, well, you know, women uh, deacons of the past only ministered to women. And I said, well, who ministers to women today? Um, I mean, if you want, I, if you want to use that as a negative argument, then then who, what what recourse do women have? I would refer you again to what the Holy Father said about the woman, basically seeking an ailment. Um, she went to the woman deacon and told her story. Uh, uh, I, I, the other part of it, though, you know, what's really interesting is. Um, the Holy Father's discussion, and he said this more than once, that men and women see things differently. And in order to have a proper uh, view of a question, you need to have both men and women looking at it. That's why I would return to the stunning to me revelation that our commission was 50% male and 50% female, because we, we have men and women looking at the issue. Um, so, so what place would they have at the table? Um, they would be at the table. Uh, what place would they have in terms of authority? They would be able to have authority um, uh, delegated to them, if you want to call it that. Uh, but in, and who would they minister to? Well, certainly, they would minister to men and to women. We, you know, we have in, in parishes we have uh, bereavement uh, ministers. Well, they minister to the widows as well as to the widowers. Uh, we have catechists. Well, they catechize men and women. Uh, we have uh, people helping with marriage prep. Well, you know, uh, men and women. We have people ha helping with baptism. I, I don't see much of a difference. Some people prefer going to men doctors. Some people prefer going to women doctors. I, I think it's as simple as that. That's great. Thank you, Phyllis. Um... Who would you say, uh, who has the authority to allow women to be permanent deacons? Is it the magisterium, the Pope? And, and then once you answer that, um, what, what's the process of, of going about establishing a female diaconate? Well, um, the way, the way, uh, the way we um, receive the, uh, the, male diaconate as a permanent vocation after the Second Vatican Council, um, we, the Holy Father wrote uh, a document in 1967, um, but basically it, it said uh, Episcopal conferences should discuss this and decide on their own if, if deacons are necessary in their territories. Um, Episcopal conferences that chose to include deacons in their territories, then gave it to the bishops because individual bishops decide what they want to do in their diocese, um, as do Episcopal conferences. The Episcopal conferences, a uh, conference of Ireland only maybe six, seven years ago decided it wanted women, uh, wanted deacons. Half of the bishops at the time uh, 
said no to deacons. Some of those bishops told me because they couldn't have women deacons, they would not have deacons at all. Uh, a motu proprio would allow the church to discuss it and uh, individual uh, 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 Episcopal conferences would decide what they want to do. And then individual bishops would decide what they wanted to do. Uh, and that, that's how it would begin. In terms of the training, it would be pretty much the same, I'm sure, as the training and formation of permanent deacons today. Um, the acronym is SHIPS that I use when I teach. Spiritual, human, intellectual, and pastoral formation uh, would be necessary. In some dioceses, it takes uh, five, six, seven years. Um, in some dioceses, it's the equivalent of a master of, of divinity degree. Um, and some dioceses, they take the courses, but they don't have to do the papers. Uh, you know, it's up to a bishop to decide uh, how. There is a directory which was written by my co-author, uh, William Deitwig, for the United States. Um, and uh, he, uh, 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 and since that time, that's been amended a little bit. But I think that, uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, it would pretty much follow the same. You know, men and women study together today now as uh, for, for the diaconate. They, uh, uh, but only the, uh, the husbands are ordained. So uh, uh, I think that would be it. In terms of, of who would be or why would be, I mean, it depends on vocations, the needs of the church. And, and the call of God, and, and these things are well tested uh, by professionals uh, in, in diocese, so. Yeah, as I've read the research, Phyllis, um, really the majority of deacons are in uh, North America and Europe, 98% of deacons exist in those places. So would you see if the female diaconate were instated, uh, it would be up to the, to the deacon, or up to the bishop in each local diocese, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and, you know, the only reason to have deacons is uh, to have more deacons is if you need more deacons. Uh, however, there is such a dearth of ordained uh, ministers in so many places that uh, uh, I, I think that uh, bishops would be uh, would be willing and well advised. I got no pushback, really. I got some pushback from the cardinal couple of cardinals from Africa and uh, a couple of bishops or actually a team of bishops they were there for Nad Limina from Laos and Cambodia they said we're so poor we, we just don't have educated people uh, we, 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 we first of all can't afford to, to educate them but our people are not educated um, we wouldn't have any problem with male or female deacons but the rest of the world from Canada from the United States from South and Central America certainly Europe and Australia and New Zealand and India had no problem with uh, with uh, adding women deacons to their needs. Uh, one uh, uh, superior, general superior of a religious order of men uh, told me about a parish that they had in Venezuela where they had two priests, one church and 14 chapels uh, around the, uh, the territory. Um, and the priests, how often could they get to the 14 chapels? Uh, the same in South America. Uh, the, um, the cardinals and bishops in South America were telling me that they, they simply needed the help. Uh, the Bishop of Sao Paulo said that he had 400 priests for 5 million people. So, you know, um, uh, yes, there are 46,000 deacons in the world. Yes, 18,500 of them are in the United States and a large majority of them are in Europe, of the rest are in Europe. Uh, but as the vocation grows and is better defined, uh, I think we'll, we'll see that those numbers uh, increase in other territories, certainly in, in Canada and in Australia and South America. Phyllis, this next question uh, comes from Jane via the chat here on Zoom. And she says, uh, if a woman wants to be a deacon now, uh, where would you suggest she begin? What might uh, be good preparation? Well, you know, just just get a spiritual director. Um, and you, it's, you can get online the directory um, for the formation of deacons. It's spiritual, human, intellectual, and pastoral. There are 
lay ecclesial ministerial programs. There are uh, standalone seminaries, the academic seminaries. Um, I, I think different people do different things. I began my own work at a Catholic seminary on Long Island. Uh, I was there for one year and then I continued. Uh, they told me I was too smart to be a deacon, so they put me in priestly training. And uh, I, I continued and completed the priestly training of philosophy and theology um, at uh, two universities, at St. John's University and Fordham University. Uh, but it's, it's uh, 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 I, would, I would just do something, do anything, you know, get whatever kind of education, but also uh, get involved in doing diaconal work. I mean, um, you, you, you need people who, who can do things. Uh, you need people who can be the catechists. You can need people who can be the chaplains. I know the uh, uh, chaplaincy training is, 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 uh, can be very intense and is also uh, uh, a specialty of, of, of the diaconate. So um, it just depends on where you are. I don't know where, you, where you're at. I, I, I don't mean this, um, uh, sarcastically, but I don't know where you're coming from, so I, I don't know where what territory uh, we're talking about here. Phyllis, this is a, a question from one of the parish groups that is working with your book, um, and they, they have a question about, you know, are there other parishes that are talking about or that you know of that are um, talking about the possibility of women deacons? Uh, are they taking advantage of the study guide that you offer, and have you received any feedback? Gee, I hope so. Yes, um, there. I know there's one parish in uh, in North Carolina. Uh, this parish, <coughs> excuse me, in in Massachusetts, as I mentioned, in the um, <coughs> in the summer when Sister Donna Changio and Sister Sandy Damasi first were developing the study guide, they tried it out at a parish in New Jersey. And uh, I actually Skyped into the fourth meeting. The way, the way it works, this, this is the book, okay, Women Deacons, Past, Present, Future, which here's the commercial. It's also available in French and recently in Portuguese um, with study guides in French and English available for free download on my website. Uh, there's another parish in Washington, D.C. that's beginning study groups, actually more than one study group. I spoke to about 80 or 100 members of the uh, parish. We're finding that, uh, and uh, I'm finding, the feedback I'm getting is that study groups of eight to 12 people um, meeting four times uh, on the topic works. Uh, you come, you, you look at the beginning, the introduction of the book, no matter what language you're looking at it in, uh, you, you uh, and set the ground rules. Uh, the study guide in, in, includes time for prayer. The whole thing takes about an hour. And then you come back uh, having read the first chapter, which is Gary Macy with history and um, understanding the history of women deacons. Uh, one feedback, uh, one, one uh, group that gave me some feedback, it was some very interesting feedback. They said uh, uh, they came back pretty angry. Like, why didn't anybody tell us about this before? Um, and then the second, uh, the third meeting would be, uh, what is the diaconate today? Um, what is the diaconate today, and what is uh, uh, what does what do the deacons do? What happened at Vatican II? And the third part uh, is uh, my section on the future. What would it mean to have women in the diaconate, including sections on um, the the tacky details about uh, the confusing details about women um, as women deacons as religious. Uh, toward that end, um, on the twenty second of August at at uh, twenty second of April at uh, St. Raffaella uh, Retreat House in Pennsylvania. I'll be meeting with about 30 women religious um, specifically to talk about and from my own research to understand better um, the considerations and concerns of women religious as deacons. Um, one, I just briefly, one question because we don't have a lot of, uh, um, we don't have a lot of uh, 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 religious on board here today. One question is who assigns the woman deacon? And uh, the person who assigns the woman deacon who is a religious to ministry is, um, is the general superior 
uh, or the local superior, however it works in the individual uh, uh, convent uh, or, or order, uh, institute or order. The, um, the other is, well, um, what about the bishop? Well, the bishop decides anyway whether somebody works in his diocese, whether you're ordained or not. Uh, the bishop can forbid someone from, from working uh, publicly in, in his diocese. Um, the individual who's ordained uh, would, would have faculties, local faculties, and you know someone in Philadelphia would go to New York, would have to get New York faculties. Well, that's the same if a uh, uh, Pennsylvania physician went to New York and needed a, a, a New York medical license. Uh, uh, but uh, but I, I think that the, uh, the future uh, the future of women deacons, I think, is here. I, I think the future is now. I, I, I do think that people, um, uh, uh, people. I, I, my first trip to Rome, uh, the steward, the chief steward on the aircraft, um, was told by a friend of mine that I'd be on board. So he got me in the galley and he, at 35,000 feet was giving me a lecture. That was the stupidest thing he ever heard, that women couldn't be deacons. So, because why not? Um, and... Uh, I, I, I think the church is ready for it. Um, certain sections of the church would, would give pushback, but certain sections of the church give pushback on anything. So what else? Phyllis, as you've conducted your research, and this is a question uh, from, from someone on the webinar, uh, is the Catholic Church getting any negative feedback from its lady or clergy about the discussion of female deacons? And what is um, your work surveying uh, different people revealed about people's attitudes on the. Yeah. You know, I have a paper, and you can download it on the off my web page, um, called "What Is the Catholic? What do the, what do the U.S. Catholics Think About Women Deacons?" Uh, there were three recent surveys, uh, one by America Magazine about a year and a half ago of women, uh, one an online survey of um, uh, general public with U.S. Catholic. And the other professional survey done by Kara of the heads of men's and women's religious communities. And the, uh, the results uniformly came out between 75 and 78 percent positive. Uh, the, uh, I, I really haven't gotten much negative feedback uh, at, at all. And as I said, I've only started speaking again publicly uh, since the middle of January. Uh, privately, uh, I lived in the Holy Father's house for a total of four and a half months uh, over the term of the commission on and off. Um, I did not get a lot of, fee of negative feedback there. I did get negative feedback, severe negative feedback from a staffer from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, but he has since been removed, I believe from the priesthood. Uh, because he came on to a, a woman religious in confession. So, uh, you know, depending on who, who, you're, who you're talking to, um, uh, I don't know, of course there's going to be negative uh, discussion, but that's important. It's important for people to discuss this thing uh, publicly and in depth. So. Uh, another question from online, Phyllis. Um, if each woman is dependent on the decision of her local bishop, um, independent of permission of the Holy Father, uh, what what options might they have if their local bishop um, wasn't wasn't uh, willing to instate the female diaconate? Well, you go to another diocese. Uh, uh, for a woman religious, and I see this question actually is from a woman religious. The first question, the first point is, uh, you need the permission of your general superior. And that, that presumes the agreement of the council to become a mixed clerical and lay institute. Um, the canonists tell me that there's no problem with having deacons in a lay institute, uh, unlike having priests in, a, uh, in an institute uh, where the current law is that the general superior would have to be a priest. So, uh, but if, if if the bishop won't ordain you, uh, two questions I think are there. Men, uh, men who seek ordination find an ordaining bishop. Uh, you know, hopefully it's their home diocese. Uh, women whose bishops won't ordain uh, deacons period, uh, women deacons period or deacons period uh, need to move. 
Um, I, I, uh, there's wonderful, uh, John of Salamis is his name, there's wonderful uh, letter, which I can paraphrase, where uh, a bishop in one diocese, I believe in Syria, was complaining to the bishop in the next diocese that the bishop in the next diocese ordained someone he didn't, he, the first diocese, didn't want to ordain. Uh, but it's an interesting letter to me because the bishop in the first diocese says, look, I ordain women as deacons and I don't send them over to your diocese. So what are, you know, what are you doing messing with my people? Uh, in the early church, actually, you were only ordained for your community. Uh, so if you were ordained in diocese A and went to diocese B, you were no longer a deacon or a priest. Uh, and and it's it's really only I think Innocent the Third who said well you know you're, you're ordained you're ordained um, but uh, there there is a, a great bond to the local church which we are kind of confused about I think because we have this uh, uh, almost political uh, trajectory of men moving from diocese to diocese to be bishops here there and everywhere and cardinals and whatever so. Uh, but I, I don't know if there's much recourse except to go to another diocese. Thanks, Phyllis. Um, question from Chris. Uh, talks about, you know, their parish is resistant to a woman even leading a communion service when the priest is absent. So uh, what can they do to educate a parish about women's roles in the church? I would say just keep talking about it. Uh, there's one diocese in the United States, Lincoln, Nebraska, that will not allow women to distribute communion during mass uh, and will not allow uh, women to serve as acolytes. If necessary, they will allow women to serve as lectors during the mass. Um, uh, it's a cultural question. I'm sure there are certain cultures, such as in Africa, where it would be much higher, uh, higher hill to climb. Um, where if an individual parish is resistant, um, then, uh, well, there are two questions. The question is, are parishes resistant to a woman even leading a communion service when our priest is absent? Um, that, that I would talk to the bishop because, uh, you know, you're supposed to be able to offer prayer to the people of God every day. Um, so... Uh, Phyllis, a question, um, kind of shifting gears a little bit about uh, the connection that's often drawn between women deacons and women priests. And so uh, the question is, uh, would it be tenable to reinstate women deacons and not women priests? And would the uh, reinstating of women deacons rule out uh, women priests at the same time? Women priests uh, are ruled out. Uh, Cardinal Ladaria, uh, presented an argument in um, the Servitor Romano last May. The Holy Father has said that door is closed. Or Nacho Sacerdotalis in 1994 basically says that that uh, door is closed. Um, there is no, we, we have not found, Gary Macy affirmed this to me two weeks ago, three weeks ago in California. Nobody's ever found any ordination ceremonies for women to be priests. There's one book circulating now uh, kind of by a popular author that says, oh, this is proof this was a woman priest, this was a woman priest here, there, and everywhere. Well, uh, here's a newsflash. Women, women deacons wore the stole the way a Western uh, uh, priest does today. So when you have a picture or uh, a, uh, uh, a fresco uh, or a mosaic of a woman wearing the stole uh, like this, she's a deacon. The confusing part is that in some cases it appears that the woman is participating in the celebrated the Eucharist. Well, yeah, um, deacons did. Uh, but uh, I, I think that the, um, uh, the, there is no doctrinal determination against women as deacons, none, never has been and never will be. Years ago, one of the highest placed women in the Vatican uh, said to me, they, uh, they, can't say, they can't say no, they just don't want to say yes. Thank you. Um, Phyllis, a, a follow-up to discussion earlier kind of about women religious and uh, female diaconate. 
And so um, if a woman religious were ordained to the diaconate, would she fall under the authority of her religious superiors or would it be the local bishop? So um, if, she was, if she was sent somewhere else or she moved into another diocese, diocese um, would she remain a deacon or would it be reconsidered based on? What I talked about was, was in the fifth century where people were ordained only in their territories for their communities. A woman uh, who is ordained to the diaconate uh, is a deacon. <clears throat> she, uh, a woman religious would be assigned to her ministry by her religious superior, um, by leave of the bishop, just as today, uh, any woman who works publicly in a diocese uh, does so by leave of the bishop. If she goes to another diocese, she goes, does that by leave of the new bishop, but she can't, uh, she can't function as a deacon without the permission of the bishop. Uh, a religious really can't go off and do what she wants with, unless she has the permission of her of her general superior. I think I think that's the I think I think that's where the confusion comes. And if the new bishop does not accept the woman deacon uh, to function as a deacon, then she can't. Uh, I, I I'd like I, and. You know, there are probably priests who have that problem. They'll go to a, another diocese and, and not give, be given permission to function. Yeah. Phyllis, um, a question about uh, clericalism. And uh, what do you think could be done to assuage the tendency to clericalism um, and to create new models of, of leadership in the church? And do you think that having a female diaconate could help with that? Yeah, I think I think clericalism is turning into be a red herring. Um, uh, clerical, yeah, clericalism in, in any profession, you know, dentists and doctors and lawyers. There's a certain amount of clericalism because we know what you don't know, and we're not going to tell you what you don't know. Um, I think the clericalism that we're upset about, uh, particularly as women, is the um, misogynist attitude of a lot of. Uh, malformed clerics with psychosexual difficulty um, who are unable to work with, uh, uh, unable to even have a conversation with anybody but another priest. Um, so I, I refer again to the, the, the fact that, uh, well, for example, there were six men and six women on the commission that I served on. Um, all six men were priests. Uh, of those, I would say um, three of the men were religious, belonged to religious orders, three were diocesan priests, and then of the women, we had uh, two women religious and one consecrated virgin. So <coughs> it depends on how you slice it, uh, what, what exactly you mean by clericalism. Um, which is a term that's been bandied about, uh, I think, unnecessarily. I, I think we all know uh, what it means when a uh, father pats, uh, pats the woman on the head and says, thank you very much, dear. That to me is clericalism. Uh, and I've said this, I've said this publicly, um, if you want your bishop to find out something, uh, if you want to give your opinion to him, the quickest way to do it is to write a letter to the editor or an op-ed page uh, and mention his name, because his cutting service will get it on his desk in, in no time. Whereas if you try to get a letter into his office, chances are you won't. Uh, particularly any complaint coming from a woman. And, and I find this in my own diocese, uh, and we see this in many other dioceses. And we know this in the tragic history of abuse in our church, that women uh, did bring uh, complaints and they were ignored. Um, so. Uh, Sunlight and bleach uh, really gets rid of the cockroaches. In that vein, um, Phyllis, there's a question regarding, um, are there any action groups that currently exist uh, to help bolster the efforts or to help bolster the work of the commission or uh, people's, uh, people's desire for a female diaconate? Are there any action groups that exist or efforts that you would suggest? Yeah, you know, Voice of the Faithful, uh, some of you may have received the uh, invitation from Voice of the Faithful. They're kind enough to uh, post a lot of stuff on their website um, and uh, to pass out invitations to the, to the webinars. Um, there's a, a group, uh, 
catholicwomandeacons.org, uh, which has downloadable letters and things like that. Uh, there's also a group called Five Theses, but again, some of these groups have other issues and other agenda. Um, uh, so in terms of a national, we need women deacons group, I'm, I'm not so, so sure about that. Um, we have uh, just a few minutes left, Phyllis, and so um, just trying to uh, pull through the questions, and if anybody has any last minute questions, they can type them in. Um, Phyllis, uh, what if, when you think about the many reasons that you've presented of why the people of God need women deacons today, um, if you were going to name one or two as your top reasons, what would you, what would you say those are? Well, I think um, when, a woman, when a woman is vested in St. Peter's uh, Basilica uh, proclaiming the gospel, then the church has the ability uh, to say what it says it says, which is that women and men are made in the image and likeness of God until, and I, I have said this in person to cardinals and bishops, until that happens, I'm going to blame you, eminence, for female genital mutilation in Africa. I'm going to blame you for dowry burnings. I'm going to blame you for wife beating. I'm going to blame you for women dying in menstruation huts in Nepal. I mean, there's disgusting things, disgusting ways that women are degraded and treated uh, as chattel and worse. Um, and, and the church needs to uh, present women and men as other Christs, as made in the image and likeness of God. Until, until that happens, um, uh, I, I think the church will remain in trouble. Uh, I, you know, I, I think that the Holy Father has the opportunity to change the conversation. Uh, about church, uh, by restoring women uh, to the diaconate. Um, I think people are sick and tired about hearing about the latest, uh, the latest tragic uh, uh, revelation coming from this or that diocese. Uh, but to, 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 I know that the CC6 now, there are only six cardinals now in his advisory body, came out the other day saying that uh, they felt they needed more women in leadership and then uh, part of the uh, press discussion was, well, we have a woman who's in charge of the Vatican Museum, and we have a woman who's the archivist of that. Well, excuse me, that's, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about including women in ecclesiastical roles, um, in hierarchical roles. The diaconate is part of the hierarchy. Um, we're talking about women um, managing churches. We're talking about women preaching. We're talking about women judging. Uh, a woman can participate in a tribunal, um, but as I said earlier, it cannot be a single judge. So uh, I think that, that the opportunity is there to change the discussion, um, to change the view of the church. You know, when you look at the celebrations this, this weekend in St. Peter's, you're not gonna find women. You may find some woman who's there to read the gospel in German or some seven-year-old to bring flowers. But the overwhelming, and I've seen it in person, the overwhelming amount of maleness um, in, in celebrations there, uh, to me, does not, does not image Christ. It doesn't give me the full picture of, of the gospel the way I understand the gospel. Um, and it doesn't bespeak the gospel to me either. I think that is a, a wonderful note to kind of bring our our conversation to close just in the interest of time, Phyllis, we're coming right up on the, the next hour. And we said we'd be here for about an hour. Um, and so to quote Gloria, who just is speaking in the chat about uh, the equality of men and women and the dignity. Uh, thank you for doing this work that helps to lift up uh, the dignity of women in our church and calls for a more uh, visible role and uh, part. And so I think you are a wonderful witness to that. Uh, and I just want to thank you for taking the time and thank everyone who's been on our webinar today. Uh, thank you for being a part of the conversation and for continuing and keeping the conversation going uh, and digging more deeply into uh, this really important topic. And Phyllis, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add or... Well, we've been trying to do this about once a month. So um, 
maybe sometime in the second part of May, we'll be able to get together again. But thanks for coming. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.